Welcome everybody. Uh, today's uh, session is the, uh, the Drupal Hosting Security Panel. And with me we have uh, Nick Shu. <laughs> Nick Shu is the platform lead of Skipper and worked at previous next. Uh, Nick leads the platform architecture of Skipper, which hosts some of Australia's largest Drupal sites. Driven and a passionate about technology, Nick Shu is a highly experienced system administrator who has been involved with the Drupal community for over a decade. Please welcome Nick. Okay, we have uh, Mike Richardson. Mike's the managing director of Einstar and he's helped government and enterprise clients secure their sites to comply with industry frameworks such as the Australian Cyber Security Standards Information Security Manual. Uh, the hosting certification framework and the payment card industry data security standard. Please welcome Mike. Uh, and finally, we have Scott Leggett. Uh, Scott's the security engineer at Amazio. Uh, Scott started his career running Unix system software over a decade ago and spent several years working with Kubernetes and cloud native technology. He's still a Unix nerd but now carries a YubiKey instead of a serial cable. Uh, Scott is passionate about integrating information security best practices into software uh, engineering and is a huge shift left security advocate. Okay, so, well, well, <laughs> thank you, Scott. Um, okay, so what we're going to try, well, I've got a bunch of questions we're going to ask the panel. Um, it's meant to be a kind of general conversation. We want to include you as well. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to open up a uh, Something I haven't tried before, but I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to basically let you submit questions through this URL. Um, you see at the top of the screen. Um, so please submit your questions about security, and we'll try and get um, we'll try and get those questions answered during this talk. Meanwhile, let's get started. Uh, so I've got a mic here. We might have to share. Um, so we will start with. Um, all right, so maybe we'll start with whoever's holding the microphone first, Scott. Um, so what are the greatest security challenges you have seen over the last couple of years? Um, so I think uh, it's been pretty high profile, some of these uh, financially motivated um, security breaches. So you've got, you know, you've got your Medicare, Medibank, I mean, uh, Optus, uh, all these kind of ransomware and hack and leak type uh, breaches. Obviously, because there's a financial motivation, um, those things are just going to continue happening. And while you've got these sort of um, bulletproof jurisdictions like uh, countries, extradition, that kind of thing, um, yeah, it's going to continue to be a problem. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. I think it's, it's a combination of apathy and awareness uh, for, for the average consumer who isn't in the security field, it, it basically feels impossible to because it doesn't seem like you know, I could jump from one provider to the next provider if I'm going to get hacked. But there's no way for, for me as an end user, as a consumer, to have any confidence that the next provider is actually going to be doing things differently and actually going to be doing what's needed. Um, so, I, yeah, I think it's, it's awareness and a sense of apathy that's making it easier for even very large corporations to get away with shortcuts. Yeah, for sure. And to pull it Scott's thread a little bit, like they're getting even more sophisticated in the type of attack. So I was in Carl's talk um, just before around CI pipelines, and the question came up around how did you handle the Circle CI breach? And, and if you look at that attack, like it started from somebody's workstation and then they worked their way up to, you know, getting keys on the platform and, and so forth. And then you hear the same thing around the like password managers and things like that. Like the attacks aren't impossible, but they're, they're definitely becoming way more sophisticated and targeted and, and um, taking that opportunity and running with it versus just a bot or a scanner, an automated scanner crawling your site and you're blocking it. So. Okay. Um, and have you seen a change in, I guess, how the, the customer security requirements that are coming to you um, your customers, have they come to you with requirements um, around security in the last two years? How's that changed? 
Um, so we, we do a lot of government stuff, and yeah, the Australian government's got a relatively new framework called the Hosting Certifica- Certification Framework, where their their in, intention is to ensure that any provider who's hosting government data ma- matches a, a minimum sort of threshold. So from, for government, we're seeing a lot more of that. Are you complying with these standards? Um, and those standards are very well defined and very, very thorough. From the private sector side of it, we've certainly had our customers come up and say, you know, are we protected? But there isn't, for most of them, any sort of framework that they can attach themselves to or any kind of checklist. So for a lot of it, they've, they're almost just kind of taking our word for it. If we say, yes, you've got good security and here's the reasons why, they might have a security team that can review all of that, um, but some of them don't and they just, they just have to have, have that faith. Um, that sort of leads into that apathy that I was mentioning before. Not that my customers are apathetic, I should clarify. <laughs> Do you find yourself having to then educate, like on the fly, as that's coming in as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, ooh, um, it is, it's, it's an education piece. Like I said, that, that's the, the awareness. So um, as an example, we had a client recently who was um, being DDoSed as part of a, of a very large DDoS across Australia where it was, they were attacking hospitals education, um, like universities, and uh, airports. And that client who was being DDoSed, they had a little bit of downtime as a result, and they were sort of communicating with other people in their industry who are all being affected by the same thing. And generally, a lot of them were like, what, what even is this? Like, how, how is this happening? How do we stop it? Um, so education was a really, really big part of that as well. Um. So yeah, I think um, yeah, basically agree with everything you just said. Um, but I think as well in the last few years, because we have do have these frameworks, um, it's kind of a good news story. Like customers are becoming much more educated about sort of these best practices. Um, and I guess from a hosting provider point of view, um, it really means that they're going to be asking questions about the best practices and you've got to sort of have a good answer that you know you really are following industry standards best practices all this sort of thing so i think um generally it's sort of one of these cases of uh you know the rising tide lifting all the boats um and yeah it's a good news story and you're seeing like it security teams stepping up a bit more joining the conversation advocating on behalf of the client as well which then only leads to better outcomes through the whole thing so yeah um i guess just so everybody knows the slides the the url should work now you try it again i just turned it on (laughs) it's too secure sorry i can't help that um so i think you you guys have been all talking about a a, you know a, a similar thing in terms of the 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 boundary there between um you know the 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 client's security posture and then the hosting platforms security posture like how are you seeing are you seeing i guess conflicts there or overlapping or are you seeing you know what what's the the general um the vibe with that at the moment yeah that's that's interesting because that's still kind of the heart of the devops movement that almost got commandeered in some ways like you've got the operations teams and the dev teams trying to talk together and you know, dev shipping X feature and then ops coming in and going, well, from my perspective, have you considered X, Y, and Z? I think that will always be the case. Like, it's always communication between teams and and how things are done. So, if anything, we just have to continue to communicate and almost kind of revive some of those old DevOps initiatives from the beginning that did get commandeered by tooling and an emphasis on tooling and ci cd and automation it was it was really about how do we work together how do we integrate together and like your uh, intro scott about like shifting left and then putting the conversation closer to developers yeah totally agree i think um but it, it is definitely helpful now that we do have these sort of hosting you know these standards that are promulgated by government organizations that you can point to, particularly if you have customers that are government adjacent or government themselves, you know, uh, these new standards do have some of these best practices talking about DevOps, talking about security and integrating that into your software development lifecycle. And um, yeah, I think it's, um, it is getting better. 
Um, the other thing I'd just add, just to echo what Laura was talking about in the keynote this morning when she was sort of saying that um, the, the standards that we're looking at kind of address the problems that we're aware of now but aren't looking forward to the problems that we'll have in, in five or ten years and that we're not really architecting for yet. And obviously there's a tremendous amount of change happening with AI and everything else at the moment. Um, in, in terms of the vibe that we see from clients, um, there is like when, when Optus gets hacked, when Medibank gets hacked, when these really big high profile events happen, we get the question of, are we protected against that? And we can, we can, we can say yes and this is why. Not every time do we get the question, what else are we protected against or what aren't we protected against that we should be? It's more, it's more reactive than proactive and that's something that I, I'd really like to be able to see change. Okay. Oh, okay. We've got some questions. <laughs> um, okay. So the first one's from Alex Matthews. He says, do any of you have experience with NZISM? If so, what are your thoughts on it? How do New Zealand government hosting requirements compare to Australia? Sorry, I'm not I'm not familiar with NZISM. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not. Oh no! <laughs> sorry, <laughs> we're in New Zealand. And... Yeah. So if if you're more familiar with the NZISM, maybe an overview of like a very quick overview of the Australian ISM which is the Information Security Manual. Um, it's, a, it's a set of about 800 criteria that the Australian government, the Australian Cyber Security Centre publishes and updates every three months. And it's a very long, long checklist of if you want to host government data at these levels of classification, these are the things that you have to do. Um, and there's very simple things like you have to have secure passwords, uh, you have to, um, why, why can't I remember the simple things? Um, so there, yeah, there's a lot of really simple controls, and then as you step up towards more uh, sensitive data, you get controls that are really, really stringent. So for example, um, we, we have to comply with the ISM, and that means if we, have, uh, if we need access to a system that might allow us to compromise that system by, say, turning off logs or modifying a firewall, we have dedicated workstations for that purpose that can't access anything else on the internet. Um, if we... You know, we all have to have uh, a corporate VPN that does inspection of all of our traffic and everything else. So it's, it's a very, very rigid framework. Um, and uh, I think, I know that there's similar uh, intentions in the UK, in Singapore, and NZ. They're all very uh, broadly based on the, the US National Institute for Standards and Technology, the NIST 800 framework, which will sort of um, the US will publish periodically and all of these national governments will sort of go, right, we're going we're to adopt this, we're going to adopt that. And there's also some really good forward-thinking stuff in the ISM as well. It's, I like the document. I think it's a really good, very thorough document. Um, and it's quite progressive in the sense that, for example, they don't recommend that you do password expiries and they don't recommend that you have complex passwords. Their recommendation is that you have long passwords that last for a very, very long time. Because those are more secure, because more secure passwords that are easy to remember are less likely to be written down. Passwords that don't reset every 30, 40, 50 days are less likely to be written down. And the reality is that a lot of people still write down their passwords. Please stop doing it. <laughs> That's okay. Um, got some good questions coming in. Um, I think this is something that I, we were going to touch on, but. Um, uh, Anonymous has, um, not the anonymous hacking group, but Anonymous has asked a question. Um, a lot of security is based around end users exploiting sites, but how are you in handling internal security? So, uh, you know, bad developers, it, and, and this is saying things like CI, CD keys, but I guess we could also talk about, you know, um, you know supply chain management. You know, we're obviously Drupal got off the island for Drupal 8, and all of a sudden we've got a lot of other people's code running on our sites or um, you know, pulling data from third-party sites, how are, we, how are we handling that? Yeah, I think there's a few factors there and some of it does come down to like separating prod, non-prod, so, and then having roles, clear roles defined and who has what. So it's really easy for um, keys and things like that to be handed out or, or access handed out to development teams and say, okay, well you get dev, dev staging production, go have fun. Um, so I think identifying those roles and having the lowest amount of permission as possible is key. Um, auditing is a great 
next step. So for us, it's AWS IAM, and then you have CloudTrail, and you can audit and monitor that and then detect, you know, are keys being used by bad actors? Have they been picked up? Um, so that's a really sort of quick thing from that side. And then from CI CD pipelines, that's is can be when things get a bit interesting because you kind of want your CI CD pipeline to have some version of control to be able to deploy to dev staging production, right? So, and then developers also interact with that a lot. So, so there's a bit of a balance there in the tooling that you're using to be able to deploy as well. And then that's a whole other set of, of roles on top of that. Um, yeah, so just on the uh, sort of the insider threat uh, part of the question there, I think, I mean, it's a really difficult problem, basically. I mean, if, if you do have something like an employee or someone who decides to do something a little bit naughty, it's not, it's not something that's very easy to protect against. And honestly, I don't, I'm not personally aware of any like great technical solutions. I think it's a lot of it is around, um, you know, sort of just vetting of employees and auditing of access and Nick mentioned, like just minimum access requirements and things like that. Um, on the, uh, the CI, CD sort of side, I think um, this concept of software bill of materials and similar things, um, this is where you have basically, if you have dependencies that you're pulling in, you have a list of those and, um, you know, with strict version locking, that's going to mean that you can sort of have a reproducible build it's not sort of pulling in the latest version of a dependency all the time. Um, all that sort of tooling is um, being built into all the package managers for whatever your programming language is. And um, yeah, I think support for that's improving all the time. So uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll just add, I think there's, there's, there's two aspects to this. There's the trusted insider that you, that you do trust, you know, your, your highest level system admins who you've done background checks on, they might have government security clearance, and you trust that person, and then there's that trusted insider's credentials, which may be stolen against their will. Those are two different problems that have the same, the, the same threat vector effectively, whether or not your trusted insider is using their credentials maliciously on purpose, or if those credentials have been stolen, your response to that is a little bit different. So without taking up too much time getting into into, into practicalities. For a trusted insider who you genuinely do trust and you want to make sure if they go rogue or they get paid off or whatever the case may be, um, your protections for that are things like logging and monitoring, having alerts. So for example, we have an alert when a trusted insider's credentials um, are, are used in an unusual way. So we'll, the whole team will get a push notification for that to say, right, this, this person's credentials have shown up somewhere that we haven't seen them before. That's suspicious. And that insider has a period of time to respond to the group and say, oh, this is intentional, I did it for this reason. Um, that also protects us in terms of uh, that, that illicit use of stolen credentials. But we also do things like uh, our, our workstations, we can't run software that isn't part of a safe list. So if somebody was to, uh, like you see a lot of attacks now where because we've all got relatively good public facing security controls, our WAFs, our firewalls and everything else, sorry, our web application firewalls and our network firewalls. Those are less common vectors of attack, unless you're Optus. Um, uh, but the more common vectors of attack are, I'm going to send you this file and you're going to run it on your desktop and then I'm going to have a backdoor into your systems. Oh, and that system just happens to have SSH access to a server and your private key on it. Um, so that, that sort of, that safe listing, that really secure workstation control, that's how you can prevent against that completely unintended um, misuse of credentials. Okay, so it's all been a, a little bit doom and gloom, um, <laughs> surprisingly, but um, I guess I'm interested in what you guys, um, you know, what, what excites you about what's coming? What's, what are the new tools or new, um, I guess, processes or things that are emerging that you guys are taking advantage of now or want to take advantage of you think that are going to be useful in the future? I think the tooling is, and it seems like a bit of a bit of a cop-out answer, but the tooling that's coming around in this kind of space. So um, from very early on, 
from the platform side, we've been sending all our logs and our auditing into centralized logging. And now we're starting to really reap the rewards of that through like from the AWS side, guard duty. Like we start to get automated alerts, AWS are continually adding more and more rules to that um, product. And then we get automated alerts. Uh, it's, it's a very low overhead kind of way to, to get a massive amount of insight and uh, I guess telemetry in some ways, but insight into what's going on in your stack that you might have missed. So I, I think it's the tooling for me. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think um, this is something I'm really excited about is just the whole rollout of uh, WebAuthn, which is this is where you have a um, sec cryptographically secure um, authentication mechanism that you can use to authenticate to a web server. And, you know, the browser vendors have done a really awesome job of, in the last few years, rolling out support for these APIs widely. So now, I don't know if anyone saw recently, um, Google rolled out pass keys for their Google accounts and they had a really amazing blog post um, which was titled The Beginning of the End of the Password. And, um, you know, it can't come soon enough because passwords are horrible. And that the thing we have to do with at the moment is work with these terrible hacks to manage how terrible passwords are by using a, you know, I guess best practice is using a password manager, which still is just like such a terrible, um, you know, why do we even have these passwords? And I think it really is the beginning of the end of the password now that everyone has. Uh, you know, if you have a modern smartphone, it's got these built-in support for these FIDO, FIDO2 authentication mechanisms, which is, you know, the what lets the hardware talk to the web server and do the secure cryptographic authentication and um, yeah, it's gonna, it'll get there. Um, the, I think the emerging tech that I'm most excited about is machine learning for reviewing logs. Um, reviewing logs and continuously monitoring logs is the most insanely boring thing that I've ever had to do. Um, and, and you have to do it because you can't just trust that your monitoring is gonna alert you about things trawling through logs every week, every month, I can't stand it. So the idea of having AI that can look at that and go, oh, that's, that's, not, that's traffic that's not part of a usual pattern, you might want to have a look at that. That's going to save so much time. Um, the other thing that I just want to add on tooling, I agree absolutely. And if you want to see a little bit more about the sort of tooling that you can use to secure your applications and maybe learn a little bit more about those government security frameworks, Danis has a talk, I think it's next, in this room. Yeah, great. So he's got a talk on the Essential 8, and uh, in, in that talk is some of the tools that you can use. So if you're interested in that, I highly recommend getting along to that. Is that okay? Are we allowed to plug other people's talks? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. I encourage it. Um, okay, so Michael's asked, um, I guess we're, we're talking a lot about like all the tools, all the things that we've got. Has web security um, become easier in, or harder in the last 10 years? Were we just naive 10 years ago and all this stuff existed, or... I guess, has the, the threat become much more severe and we're, we're actually having to rise to that threat level or um, are we just becoming more sophisticated? You answered it. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, I mean, think of like, even like was from the, I guess, the armadillo model 10 years ago, right? Like, was there a Cloudflare? Was there these sophisticated things that you could just put in front of your web server and then protect yourself against somebody who wants to, you know, get in through the front door of your website? Not really. Um, so, yeah, if anything, yep, the tooling has gone up and up and up um, in a big way, but that has absolutely been in direct competition with adversaries and the like as well and the changing landscape that's come over the past 10 years. I might, I might just add to that question, like, you know, we, we looked at that talk this morning, there was you know, the, the OWASP list looked similar. Are there, are, do you feel like there's different kinds of threats now? Or like, are they, are they getting, uh, or are we still facing the same kind of security threats that we were 10 years ago? Uh, yeah, um, sorry. Uh, I think probably some of the technical, um, some of the specific uh, OWASP, I guess, top 10 vulnerabilities may have changed a little bit, but I mean, as um, 
you know, was illustrated in the talk this morning, um, you know, a lot of the same mistakes are being made. Um, but I do think that in general, uh, the tooling that's available now um, can really help uh, you to sort of avoid falling into these really common, um, I guess, uh, problems that you can see in the OWASP top 10. I mean, uh, the technology that we've got in our code editors these days, um, you know, that can basically do static analysis on your code as you're writing it. Um, if you're using something modern like VS Code or um, you know, even NeoVim or whatever, uh, it's all got language server protocol support, which means that you can have software that's constantly watching what you're doing and helping you avoid some of the most common pitfalls, which, I mean, is just amazing. Yeah, but even going back to in the sort of beginning, I think it was around the first question, like the type of attacks from just somebody's local workstation and working their way up, figuring out what they have access to and working their way up, like that's, that's, that's scary new territory now. Like there was, I can't remember who it was, but somebody got hacked through Plex, like they were running Plex locally at home. That was, that was Circle CI. Was it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it was LastPass. Oh, it was LastPass. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Which okay. is even yeah. scarier because that's, that's the, you know, <laughs> that's the crown jewels right there. So, yeah, I, I think the surface area is getting even bigger too on how to hack somebody, how to get in, and all those entry points are just, aren't just the typical coming from the front door of the web the website anymore. There's some really cool, um, so going back to that notion of, you know, is, uh, is the tooling getting more sophisticated? Is there tooling now that we couldn't access before? I think there's some instances where the tooling isn't necessarily revolutionary or not something that we had, but it's being exposed in response to more sophisticated attacks. So to, to give you two examples, um, we've got a system that we purchased from a vendor that watches what users do on our systems. And if they start doing things like catting ETC password and looking at files that they shouldn't usually look at, we get alerts for that. So we get that sort of footprinting alert. Um, and that ability for, the, for the, this, this malware tool to look into the kernel to see what users are looking at in real time, that's sort of always been there, but it's never, been, it's never bubbled up to the surface in a way that's so easy to consume. Um, the other thing that I would say is uh, in response to attackers becoming more sophisticated, we can all sort of remember when two-factor authentication came about and it was heralded as the, if you use two-factor authentication with your password, you'll be safe. And we were for a time until attackers started to create websites that look and feel like the website that you really thought you were print, you're entering your two-factor code into and your password, and then all of a sudden they've got everything they need. So now we have tools like push notifications with secure apps onto our phones, where if you try to log into something like Okta or Microsoft.com, you'll get a push notification saying, is this really you? Um, and you don't have to use that two-factor code, which is, which is so much better, and that, that passwordless journey is really good to see. Um, the other thing I would just add is those tools are becoming a lot more expensive, um, and it's becoming more and more difficult to compete with those tools enabled against providers that aren't enabling those tools who can, who can sort of offer uh, seemingly better value, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm so interested in, in what the government is doing in terms of saying we all have to have this common baseline so you, you don't get that. Um, that point of like, you know, somebody overseas just saying, well, I can do that for half the price and it's, it'll be just as good. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so I guess one thing that just off the top of my head I was thinking about this morning was, um, you know, we're talking about IA um, and, and this isn't really hosting security, but the idea that, um, you know, we've got copilot and code generators, you know, people aren't, um, people aren't really questioning security vulnerabilities in like all this auto-generated code, right? It's just sort of like accept it because the machine told them it was going to work. Um, anyway, that's just a comment. It's not a question. So, um, Okay, so we're, we were nearly wrapped up. Um, I just thought final word, like if people are interested in security and keeping on top of, um, you know, um, that side of things, what, who do you recommend to follow on social media or uh, websites to Follow. I'll go with a fun one to begin with, the Risky Business or Risky Biz podcast, which is an Australian podcast, security, 
goes through all the, the big news stories of the week, has a bunch of commentary over it. I think that's a really, really good sort of nice entry point into it as well. Also, one of the hosts is uh, a Kiwi, so. Um, yep, so definitely echo uh, Risky Biz. Um, I'm a listener myself. And uh, I don't know if anyone's uh, followed the uh, or on Mastodon at all, um, but uh, a lot of the people I used to follow on Twitter that have moved have moved on to a, there's a Mastodon instance called infosec.exchange. Um, and if you have a look at the local feed there, there are heaps of interesting people doing, um, you know, security research, um, journalism, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, can recommend. Uh, also Risky Biz, and I would say, I just plugged someone, um, Falcon Feeds IO. I don't have social media, so this is a little bit of a hard question for me. But um, these guys were, that, that DDoS attack that was going around with all the universities and, and hospitals and whatnot earlier this year, um, they were one of the first to sort of announce the group that was behind it and provided a lot of really good detail. So that was sort of the first time when, when the attack started, we were like, well, is this, what is this, where is this coming from? And then when we looked at that feed, we're like, okay, that's this. And now we can reach out to other people who are likely being affected. And we were able to sort of collaborate with them on what was going on. So that was, that was good. All right. Um, we might be out of time unless anyone's got any... I think there's any last minute questions. So would you please thank our panelists?